This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and in my hands is the 2024 14-inch M4 MacBook Pro. Specifically, yeah, 14-inch here at 16 inches, ever always available, and it puts me in my happy place. This has been a weird year. We've seen updates on Ryzen that have some incremental improvements in performance. We've seen Intel actually seem to slide backwards with some of their processes in terms of performance, so improved efficiency. And then there's Qualcomm Snapdragon, which did pretty well. But for people who actually needed x86 in the Windows world, it wasn't as big a splash as we could hope for. So somehow Apple every year manages to surprise us in a good way. So uh, as ever, yes, you can now get it in space black, which let's be real, this is not exactly black, very dark gray or silver. The space gray is gone. I guess that's okay. It's your choice. Fingerprints will show some on this, so keep that in mind. If that bothers you, that's what silver is for. But anyway, the performance improvements here. Wow, like 20% better than the M3. Uh, typically, because CPU improvements on a lot of platforms just go a little bit every year, they'll compare back a couple of generations. This, we're talking M3 to M4. A lot more to talk about right now. But before we get into that, let's talk about the many, many things that have stayed the same from the previous generation generations. Same physical design, same overall battery capacity, same keyboard, same trackpad, so I'm not going to address those. And the same mini LED technology display with the same resolutions as last generation. One change here is that now you have the nano texture display option. And unlike the iPad Pro, where you're forced into buying the really high end, high capacity model just to do that, so it became a very big spend. Here, any configuration or 14 or 16 inch that you want, you can add that on. It's $150. They stock some of them even at the Apple store currently if you just want to get one off the shelf. And oh my God, it's worth it. I know there's been discussion about, oh, do you see t any texturing? Is text less clear? Not as vibrant? I, you know, I worried about that too. I'm Having reviewed the M4 iPad Pro with and seen that display option. For the iPad, I didn't want to go nano, but then also that's a content consumption device, and sometimes you want those rich blacks and you're using it in a darker place maybe to watch movies, less glare. But with the Mac, I really miss, back in 2000, up until 2009, you could get a MacBook Pro with a matte display, and they took that away. And it's somebody who edits photos and video all the time, particularly. The glare, you know, you, your brain tunes it out, but let me tell you, it's always there, you know. It's not just that, oh, look, I can see I got spinach in my teeth, I just had lunch kind of thing. It's, it takes away from the image quality in a way where it looks washed out and milky under certain lighting conditions. Forget if you're going outdoors in bright light or you have a very bright, artificially lit office or something like that. And no, the texture is a nano etched glass, okay? So if you've used like a matte ThinkPad, a recent one, not the old, old ones that did look kind of grainy or something like that, then you know, it's it's really not degrading the quality of the display. Text looks really sharp. To me, in most lighting situations, it looks actually more vibrant because colors pop through. There isn't that glare subduing things. A, a lot of talking about that. But if you're on the fence, I say just go for it. It's really nice. Even if you are just watching movies and not creating content, it, it's it's just great stuff. And you won't find yourself angling your display all the time to try to get rid of some of that glare. That's there. Okay, that's worth it. The other change for the mini LED display who has the same resolution, P3 color gamut and all the stuff as last generation, lovely lovely display is that now it is 1000 nits of brightness in SDR mode, standard mode, not HDR or anything like that, as opposed to 600 nits for the previous generation. So that's a big jump. Caveat is that's with auto brightness enabled and it will base the brightness setting on ambient light. You can't just crank it to a thousand nits all the time, probably because then you'd be complaining about your battery life, right? So, but that's, that's a significant improvement. And that's something that mini LED brings to the table over OLED. I know some people are really hoping Apple goes to OLED and I can understand. I mean, OLED's beautiful, but two things, image retention, burning kind of things. And it's really hard unless you go QD OLED to get something as bright as this. And a laptop is something you might take outdoors or in bright settings. So that's nice. And if you are running in HDR mode in 1600 nits for peak brightness. Okay, enough about the displays. What else is the same? You still have Wi-Fi 6E and Bluetooth 5.3. I have no idea what they got against Wi-Fi 7 there. Still, as ever, you have ports. You have your Thunderbolt ports. We'll get into the... That gets a little complicated. An HDMI port and a full-size SD card slot. And, of course, the MagSafe 3 connector for charging. 
ports, let's talk about that. So one thing that was really not fun about the base 14 inch MacBook Pro was that it was nerfed in terms of, well, several things. Uh, the number of ports, it only got two instead of three Thunderbolt ports. Now, even the base model gets three and supports two external displays. All Macs, when they're quoting a number of external displays, that's in addition to the internal built-in display, so you know that. So good that, you know, it's not like the base 14 inch MacBook Pro was just barely better than a MacBook Air in some ways, it sort of seemed like that. Now it's up there with the big boys or girls, depending on how you want to look at that. So when I say Thunderbolt it gets complicated, so the base M4 processor, and this is a limitation they've tied to the processor, supports Thunderbolt 4, which is lovely. But if you go for an M4 Pro or Max, it doesn't matter which size of the two MacBooks you go with, then you get Thunderbolt 5, which doesn't really matter now, but as fast Thunderbolt 5 peripherals, probably external drives for video editors and folks like that particularly become available, then it will probably matter. But there you have it. Okay, pricing is the same as last time around. $1,600 starting price for the base 14-inch MacBook Pro, $2,500 bucks for the 16-inch base MacBook Pro. Difference in CPUs there. With the 14-inch, it starts with the M4 processor, and with the 16-inch, it starts with an M4 Pro. Both of them can be configured with Pro in two different configurations. Some people call it bin or unbin, which means one has more processor and GPU cores than the other one, and you can get them both with Max. RAM, to a certain extent, is tied on which processor you choose, where the M4 is more limited. If you want to go up to 64 or 128 gigabytes, you're looking at the Pro or the Max processors. Next thing I want to talk about is Last year, you know, I would have been okay even as a power user with a, a Pro model CPU, one of the two. Uh, but Apple kind of nerfed the performance a little bit where it wasn't as impressive as we would have liked. And so it kind of pushed you into the Max processor, right? So I ended up with a 16 inch base Max processor model here. And this year, the Pro is incredibly capable. So we have the, just like we had last year for review in the 14 inch, the higher end of the M4 Pro processor this is the one with more CPU and GPU cores than the base M4 processor, right? Uh, it is faster than my M3 Max when it comes to CPU stuff. Now with the GPU, there's still like 10 more GPU cores in the Max, so it's gonna do better. Even though some tests make it look not as far apart or almost equal, if you're looking at Cinebench 2024, you'll see strong graphics still in a Max processor, even from the previous generation. And likewise in games where it approaches an RTX 4070 in terms of performance. So if graphics is super important to you, and obviously Macs are not so much for gaming people because there just aren't that many high quality games available. Probably that isn't a use case, but if you're doing a lot of blender renders day in day out, that's what you do, 3D rendering for a living or something like that. That's where it makes sense still to look at the Max processor. For those of you who are even professional video editing, and I count YouTubers like us who do this for a living as professional video editors, um, professional photographers, all sorts of other things, really a pro is more than enough at this point, and it's astounding. Again, if you look at the identical configuration for the 14 inch last year and this year, M3 Pro to M4 Pro, the higher end of that processor, when you see 20% jump in performance, it's like, wow, how are they still managing to do this? And you think battery life, battery life's gonna tank. Well, no, I got more efficient too. So it can do the same thing using less battery power too. So battery life has not suffered. So you're getting 25% better performance, 20% better performance, depending on what you're doing, while not consuming any more power. This is what we like to see, right? So it's good, it's good. 2024 had its ups and downs with processors. Apple gives us faith. The, the drawbacks as always with Macs are two things. Number one, if you need native Windows x86 and you don't wanna run it under parallels or something like that, well, <laughs> Mac's not gonna do that for you. And the other thing is they're pricey, right? Now I would say a 14 inch MacBook Pro is now a viable machine. All Macs now start with 16 gigs of RAM, so no more whining about the eight gig of RAM thing, right? So that's, that's good enough and 512 gigs of storage too for the MacBook Pros. So for 1600 bucks, that's not so far from a premium or premium-ish sort of Windows machine. And 
you know, people compare these to ultrabooks and they're more powerful. So in a way it's disingenuous. They might be portable. They might be reasonably light, kind of slim, not super much, but I mean, these are pushing into Asus ROG Zephyrus G14 and G16 territory here. That's the level of performance you're getting while looking at the power consumption of an ultrabook. So the pricing for the lower end models is pretty fair. As ever with Apple, you know how it is. You add more RAM, you add particularly more storage, then the prices get astronomical. And because those are integrated into the CPU package, you can't upgrade them afterwards. So that's a hurt. So for those of you who want eight terabytes of storage, don't do it. You got Thunderbolt 5 boards, use external storage because the, the prices are crazy. Why would you configure an $8,000 Mac if you didn't have to, right? Anyway. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos and a thumbs up if you like this vid.